Space Station Silicon Valley is a charming little N64 game that I wish I saw more people talk about. I mean, it's not that obscure, all things considered. I'm not trying to pretend like I'm the first person to shine a spotlight on this game. There's only like 400 N64 games total. Not that many compared to the PS1 for instance, so I'm pretty sure all the remotely playable ones have been identified by now. Still, I don't see this game getting mentioned that often, so I feel compelled to give it some attention. The game stars two heroes for hire, Dan Danger and Evo the Robot. After being lost in space for a thousand years, the eponymous Space Station Silicon Valley has returned, and our heroes are sent to investigate. After getting into an argument about music, they end up crash landing, during which Evo's body is shattered into pieces, leaving him as a tiny, vulnerable microchip. In order to get his body back, he has to inhabit the bodies of the robot animals of the space station. This is the central gimmick of the game, the ability to swap bodies between different kinds of robotic animals. The game is divided into a number of stages, spread across four biomes, Europe, Ice, Jungle, and Desert, each with a completely different set of animals to play as. The levels aren't just typical linear get from point A to point B platforming stages, they require the player to complete a set of objectives in order to activate the exit teleporter first. These range from solving some sort of puzzle to killing all of a certain type of animal. Each stage has different objectives to keep things fresh. They're always doing something different. Actually, one of the reasons I'm making this video is because I haven't replayed this game since I was a kid. I'm basically just giving myself an excuse to play it again. Huh. Okay, well, it seems to be freezing at the same part of the opening logo sequence every single time I try to play it. That's weird. I guess there's something wrong with my copy of the game or something. So, here, let's just immediately buy a new copy of the game like a dumbass and... Oh? What's that? The exact same thing is happening? That's so weird. It's almost like there's something wrong with my N64 or something. So what, I can't play the game? Well, actually, if I had used my brain for two seconds, I would have realized you can actually just hold start to skip these logo sequences. There. Problem solved. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. You see, there's a specific part of the first cutscene that will always crash the game, too. This cutscene is unskippable and plays whenever you start a new save file. So as far as I can tell, if your cartridge is brand new or just has no save files for whatever reason, you're fucked. But. As long as you have a single save file that's past the intro cutscene, you're okay. Except, there's actually another place the game crashes every single time. And that would be the first second of the first level. Yeah, if you select the first stage, the screen will fade to black and then immediately freeze. So, damn, I guess the whole game is just totally broken, huh? Well, actually, these are the only three places I've found that cause the game to crash. Admittedly, I didn't go through the entire game, so I wouldn't be surprised if there were more, but I didn't find any. If you have a save file past the intro cutscene, even if you haven't beaten the first level, which won't load, you can still use cheat codes to unlock the rest of the stages, and none of them have any issues as far as I can tell. At the very least, you can load into all of them, unlike the first stage. So if you don't mind not being able to watch the opening cutscene or play the first level, and have at least one save file that's already been started, then technically there's no problem. So, okay, why is this happening? Well, I assure you, the reason is incredibly stupid. Believe it or not, it's this thing right here. The Nintendo 64 Expansion Pack. Out of every single N64 game, this is the only one which has any sort of problems with the Expansion Pack. A fair amount of games can utilize it, but only two games actually require it to run. Majora's Mask and DK64, which is where I got mine from, of course. Even when I'm not playing DK64, it still manages to find a way to fuck me over. Well played, Rare. Well, I guess I better take this thing out. How the fuck am I supposed to remove this thing? Let me just check the official Nintendo websites page on the N64 Expansion Pack installation process, see if it has any tips. The N64 Expansion Pack is designed to work with all N64 game packs, even those which do not use the expansion features. Once the expansion pack is installed, it is normally not necessary to remove it from the control deck. Gee, thanks a lot, you don't have to rub it in, Nintendo, you pricks. Well, there's no info specifically on removing the expansion pack, but let's see what they have to say about removing the jumper pack, the thing that originally came in the expansion slot. Oh, of course. I just have to use my jumper pack ejector tool. I guess it's this little piece of plastic. Well, I definitely don't have one of those, am I just screwed? 
If you do not have a jumper pack ejector tool, you may use a small spoon to remove the jumper pack. Oh, gee. Thanks, Nintendo. Thank you for allowing me the privilege of using a fucking spoon. Okay, well actually it's not too hard to get out after all. Although personally I would recommend using a butter knife instead, even though it's not the official Nintendo approved utensil. Okay, perfect. Now let's just boot up the game and oh wait. Of course, the system doesn't fucking work without a jumper pack. If you do remove the expansion pack, you will need to reinsert the jumper pack for the system to operate. Wonderful. I don't know where my fucking jumper pack is, it literally serves no function once you have the expansion pack outside of this one specific instance of wanting to play this one game. So what the hell does the jumper pack even do? According to Wikipedia, it serves no functional purpose other than to terminate the RAM bus bus in the absence of the expansion pack. I don't exactly know what all those words mean or what the hell a RAM bus bus is, but basically I can tell I'm getting fucked here. So I guess I'll just buy another one of these too, like an asshole. Also, it turns out some copies of the game have no issues with the expansion pack. Finally, after all that, I got the game running on actual hardware. Eh, fuck this, I'm just gonna use an emulator. Okay, but after all that bullshit, I still wanted to know, why is this happening in the first place? After looking around enough, I finally found an explanation from a reliable source, some guy on 4chan. Hopefully this explanation will satisfy you if you're like me and you always wanted to know the root cause of this glitch. In the past I've avoided emulating this game as most of the major emulators I've tried like Project 64 or Moopin64 Plus seem to have some kind of graphical issues. The emulator I've found that works best for this game is BizHawk 2.3 with a Glide video plugin. Normally I don't feel the need to be so specific with my emulator recommendations. But I don't want to recommend this game and then have a bunch of people go try to emulate it and play some shitty glitched out version. The graphics aren't particularly impressive, but they have a certain charm to them. The humor and style of the game was actually shaped by hardware limitations. In a great Game of Sutra article, programmer Grant Salvona recalls, Our artists were using silicon graphics workstations to create the character models, and on their monitors these appeared crisp and sharp, but when we rendered them on the N64 dev boards they always appeared in soft focus slightly smudged due to the inbuilt anti-aliasing. Someone commented that they looked almost like they were made of plasticine, so we went with a Wallace and Gromit look. Certainly Wallace's crazy inventions provided some inspiration for our level design. The game definitely has a very cheeky British sense of humor. The game features dead scientists in certain levels, one mission requiring you to collect their severed heads. The mission objectives are also quite amusing. They come from Dan directly, and instead of feeling like some logical, coherent set of goals, sometimes it feels like you're just indulging his random whims. The game has a very pleasant and catchy soundtrack. One amusing little detail about this game that I really like is the music is diegetic. It actually exists in the game world. It's coming out of these speakers you can find across the stages of the game. As you move further away from the speakers, the music gets quieter. And if a stage doesn't have any speakers, then it doesn't have any music, like the sewer level. Hell, you can even blow up the speakers of certain animals, allowing you to remove the music from the stage entirely if you want. In fact, one of the stages even has this as a specific objective because Dan was getting sick of the music in that level. The fact that animals bob their heads and the speakers thump to the beat is also a nice little touch. So outside of an animal body, Evo can skitter around as a little microchip, but in this form your health slowly drains, so it's best to stay inside of an animal whenever possible. To take control of an animal, first you have to kill it, but it's okay, because they're just robots. Well, I mean, I guess you're also a robot in this game, but don't worry, it's not like they can talk and have personalities and fall in love and stuff. Oh, wait, wait actually, I guess they do do that, as shown in the game's opening sequence, but, you know, whatever, just don't think about it. Like I said, you know, British sense of humor. There are 42 different playable animals in this game. I won't go over every single one, but some of my favorites include the spring ram, the bear, the boxing kangaroo, the racing tortoise, and the hyena, who attacks by laughing his opponents to death. I also really like the king rat. Regular rats will swarm around him and follow him, and one of his abilities is to send them out to attack in a swarm. The king penguin also has a similar ability. Each animal has different stats which you can view when you first take control of them or by bringing them to one of these screens. The green bar represents your health, while the blue bar represents the health of the enemy you're attacking. The two bubbles represent the energy for your abilities, one for the A and B button. Some abilities like the racing dog's homing missiles take energy which regenerates slowly over time, while some basic abilities like jumping don't use energy at all. The game has some interesting puzzles to solve, and you can get pretty creative with solutions. 
You don't have to be a genius to figure out some of the more advanced techniques like stacking dead animals in order to carry them around, or using microchip evo to get into the smaller locations. You can also take advantage of the natural food chain or ecosystem of a level. Like if you start as a mouse, instead of just attacking the racing dog head on and dying to its missiles, you can bait the dog into a fighting with the ram first and lowering both of their health, allowing you to inhabit the body of whoever lost the fight and use it to finish the job. Or you can use the stage hazards like this falling box to kill the dog. Typically animals won't attack members of their own species unless attacked first. Some of the levels aren't that amazing, like the sewers level, or this level where you have to bomb all the turrets, or this stupid fucking fish level. But most of the levels are really fun and inventive scenarios. One issue I have with the game is there's no checkpoint feature of any kind. If you die at any point, you're gonna have to restart the whole level again from the beginning. Now this isn't a huge problem, since none of the missions are that long, but it can be very frustrating to die near the end of a stage, and there are certain situations in which you can die very quickly. I know suggesting using emulator functions to compensate for a game's shortcomings is totally cheating, and normally I would balk at such a suggestion, but I'm just trying to ease people into a game that might lack some features we take for granted in a modern title. My two main issues with the game are the slow-ass movement speed of some animals, and no checkpoints, and both of these issues can be fixed with a very light dose of speed up and save stage when necessary. I'm not saying you have to be one of those assholes who drops a new save state every 10 seconds, but if a level is really busting your balls, feel free to give yourself a checkpoint after completing one of the objectives or something. If you can play and enjoy the game without them, then great. I'm just saying if the alternative is you not enjoying the game, then go ahead. The game was released to critical acclaim, but unfortunately it didn't sell particularly well. Why is that? If it's so great, why didn't more people buy the game? Well, according to Salvona, one of the reasons why had to do with when it launched. Nintendo worked on a scheme of dividing their marketing budget into quarters. They would have a big push for four games a year. Space Station Silicon Valley was initially penciled in for a quarter one 1998 release when it would have received the promotion it deserved. Unfortunately, it slipped to a quarter three release when Nintendo put all their advertising behind their own Ocarina of Time release. Sales definitely suffered due to it being released at the same time in Zelda. As stated earlier, the game is divided into discrete stages, but is not completely linear. Once you finish three stages in a biome, you unlock the next one, meaning that if you get tired of a certain set of animals, you can go do some stages in a different area if you want. The game doesn't feature traditional boss levels. Instead, the final stage of each area features a special challenge that presents some kind of unique scenario. For the Euro section, there's this cute little dog fighter arena where you play as a dog plane. As long as you figure out you can recharge your health in these trenches, it's not too bad. For the ice area, they have Wall Race 64, which is self-explanatory. Not bad, but it's just a race, nothing too special. The desert area has a boxing minigame. Also not bad, and the kangaroo's combat is definitely better than some of the other animals, but ultimately this is just some normal combat. Unfortunately, the one for the jungle section is not very good at all. In the biggest departure from the game's main style of gameplay, you're forced into this auto-scrolling shooter section, and with the N64 controls, it's just not that great. But hey, it's just one stage, and the whole point of these final stages is to experiment and change things up. Not all of them are going to be winners. Once you complete all four bonus stages and collect Evo's body, you gain access to the final stage, the Big Celebration Parade. Because the whole game is just about trying to get Evo's body back, there's not really any kind of main antagonist. It's just you against the wildlife of the space station in general. They sort of poke fun at this in the finale, where you're forced to confront the evil brain, who has never once been mentioned before this sequence. They tease you like it's going to be a boss battle or something, but you just use your laser on him and then he immediately explodes. The real finale is running around on Earth, destroying the escaped animals and using Evo's newly rebuilt body. This is the only mission which actually uses Evo's robot body, and it's pretty fun just running around blowing up animals with your laser beam. Evo's status in this mission depends on how many of the game's power cells you've picked up. Less than 250 and you get the bronze body, which is the weakest. If you did get at least 250, you get the silver body, and if you collected all 390 power cells, you get a gold body for Evo, which is the strongest and has the most health. The game gives you a fairly generous time limit, but when you're down to the last few animals, it can be kind of a pain trying to track them down. And after you're done killing them all, that's it. Just a self-aware joke about the mild anticlimax followed by a credits roll. In addition to the main objectives, every stage also has a secret objective which you have to figure out for yourself and upon completion you're awarded with a gold trophy. These objectives can be anything, from winning a race, to jumping through all the rings, to killing all the animals in a stage. Sometimes you have to solve some kind of puzzle, possibly involving switches. 
They range in quality, sometimes the challenge is a unique and interesting objective specific to the current map or scenario, and sometimes it's just kill all the scorpions, or kill all the scorpions, again. If you collect all the trophies you unlock a little bonus game, but you won't be doing that because in the stage Fat Bear Mountain somehow the developers failed to notice that it's impossible to collect the trophy. You can complete the secret objective and get the trophy to spawn, you can even reach it. But somehow, they forgot to activate the hitbox, so you simply pass right through it. Wow. A single spinning golden collectible permanently standing between me and 100% completion. Well, luckily I'm a mature adult, and that's not really the kind of thing that bothers me. Seriously though, come on DMA design, how did you guys not notice this? I mean, sheesh, with coding this shoddy, there's no way these guys are still around, right? I mean, I don't remember playing any games by DMA recently, do you? Let me just check online real quick to make sure these guys have gone out of business... Oh. Actually, it turns out these guys are still around, and they're one of the most successful, profitable, critically acclaimed game development studios of all time. You probably know them better by their current name, Rockstar North of GTA and Red Dead Redemption fame. First Rare, now Rockstar. Goddamn cheeky British devs. Learn how to program your games properly, you wankers! Although I guess now that you mention it, I do see the similarities between this and GTA. Hopping between different animal bodies isn't fundamentally that different from hopping between cars. So is the bonus game just unplayable? Well fortunately the developers had the foresight to include cheat codes, one of which can be used to unlock this extra game. And to be honest, this bonus game is nothing special. It's just a little horizontal shmup or asteroids type game. Cute but not much depth to it. I guess on the other hand, it's better than no reward. But the real joy of collecting the trophies is knowing you're a 100% completion cool guy or a 99% completion in this case. Something I thought was pretty cool is there's a patch you can download by romhacking.net user Azidual, which fixes both the trophy hitbox issue and the expansion pack issue, as well as including a language select screen for the NTSC version. Interestingly, despite the fact the game was only released in North America and Europe, there exists a completed Japanese translation of the game inaccessible in every copy, which can be activated with some simple GameShark codes. Speaking of cheat codes, remember them? Weren't they fun? Not just the nice utility of having level select and infinite health and whatnot, but devs used to include completely pointless and stupid cheat codes, and this game is no exception. Like check out this cheat which screws with the camera and makes your animal rapidly grow and shrink, or this one which gives your animal a tiny body and big head. This one gives you unlimited energy but flips the camera upside down. What the hell is the point of any of this? Just for a laugh. There's also an interesting cheat which appears to shake the screen, but otherwise has no effect. But actually, if you enter this cheat while playing as the bear, you transform into a juggling unicycle bear, an animal not seen in the normal game. You can see him in one of the game's alternate intros, though. If you hold A or B when starting the game, then instead of getting the normal DMA logo sequence, you'll get one of two alternate intros, one of which features the unicycle bear. But he's not actually featured anywhere in the main game. Or so I thought. It turns out there's one brief, incredibly easy to miss appearance right at the start of the stage, the control room. This is a stage which features a lot of bears, and immediately after starting the stage, if you go forward, you can see a unicycle bear go past, and if you're incredibly quick, you can actually get around the corner and watch him explode and despawn. There's not too much pre-release information available for this game, apart from a handful of screenshots which look quite different from the final game. You can see a number of different UI elements that were in development, from a health bar at the top of the screen to one in the bottom left that looks closer to the final design. Based on some of the animal renders seen in magazines, it seems at some point in development there's going to be a playable alligator, as well as some kind of blue kangaroo. These blue kangaroos are also barely able to be made out at the bottom of this beta image of the desert area. I also wanted to see if there was any video of this game while it was still in development. In this E3 1997 footage, you can see the UI and stage textures look completely different, and more than that, it actually shows footage of a playable flying fox which only appears as an enemy in the final game. It also features footage of a playable frog, which again only appears as an enemy during the final level. In the footage, he also just instantly changes animals instead of swapping bodies as Microchip Evo, but I'm gonna guess this was just for gameplay demonstration purposes for the footage. I looked around, but this one minute long clip from E3 97 seems to be the only beta footage that DMA publicly showed off before the game's release. But actually it turns out there's one more piece of publicly available beta footage from an unlikely source. 
Oddly enough, the music video for the song Twift by the German electronic music duo Mouse on Mars is made up entirely of beta footage from the game. According to an email published by Unseen64 from one of the producers of the video, they met DMA while filming interviews for a German and French TV art special on virtual designs. Apparently they were able to convince them to send a beta cartridge of the game to capture some footage for the music video they were working on. You can see all sorts of large areas that aren't present in the final game, like this massive cave area, a lot of shots of the unicycle bear, non-racing mice that appear to have feet like rabbits and can walk around, and some sort of helicopter mouse. Most shots seem to have this timer at the bottom which wasn't present in the final game. There's some pretty interesting stuff in here, and it seems like this is from pretty early in development. I had no idea until I started making this video, but apparently there's a shitty PS1 port that came out two years later only in Europe called Evo Space Adventures, which is a much worse title for the record, and it totally looks like shit and has worse music. And despite being on a CD-ROM, it's actually missing a few levels from the original. DMA had nothing to do with this awful port, and it was handled by some studio called RuneCraft. The frame rate is abysmal, the controls are sluggish, and the draw distance is genuinely pitiful. It's honestly difficult to truly convey how bad a port this is. The intro cutscene is replaced with a pre-rendered FMV in this version, which is kind of interesting at least. There is also a Game Boy Color version, which is, you know, fine I guess, it's a Game Boy Color game. Maybe I'll take a more thorough look at this version someday, but I'm not really feeling it right now. You know, there's not a huge Space Station Silicon Valley community out there, but it does have its fans, so I feel like I should give a shout out to Mikhail, who runs the game pretty regularly on Twitch. He also ran it at SGDQ 2015, and has a nice little series of videos on YouTube showing how neat things you can do in the game. Like here in the first level, you can push this box over to this speaker, then if you jump and bark at the same time, you get launched up here, and you can find the area used in the opening cutscene. I love shit like that. So I guess the point of this video is, God damn it! why aren't there more body swap games? It's such a good premise for a video game. I mean, don't get me wrong, Space Station Silicon Valley didn't invent the concept. It can be seen in older titles like Paradroid for the Commodore 64, in which you must defeat robots by either destroying them or taking them over, or Taito's Avenging Spirit, a nifty little arcade game which allows you to possess enemies. But I really want to see this mechanic used more. Like, yeah, sure, it saw some mainstream attention in Mario Odyssey, and don't get me wrong, I really like the possession mechanic in that game, as you could probably guess. But to be fair, you spend the vast majority of that game as regular Mario, because he's just so much more versatile. Only taking control of enemies for brief situational moments, they kind of feel more like stage gimmicks in a way. And that's totally fine, nothing wrong with that, it's probably the best way to implement that feature into a traditional 3D Mario game. But it's like the opposite of Space Station Silicon Valley, where your base form is the weakest, least desirable state to be in, making the focus much more on the complex web of potential hosts and their interactions, you know? I guess I should give a shout out to the game Tokyo Jungle, which is not a body swap game exactly, but probably the most like Silicon Valley in the sense it's a game about playing as a bunch of different kinds of animals. It seemed to get okay reviews, but I haven't actually played it yet, I think it's a PS3 and Vita exclusive, so I can't definitively comment on it one way or another, but it definitely seems interesting. Although it's trying to be a different kind of game from Silicon Valley, which is fine too. Still, I love to see a more modern take on Space Station Silicon Valley. Maybe if GTA Online ever stops printing money, we can convince Rockstar to make it. Till then, maybe give this game a try if any of this looked interesting to you.